We've all had that experience when listening to a piece of music that we've heard something similar elsewhere. This is why, no matter how eminent the songwriter or composer, there is always a precedent. This is why I think it's difficult to define a true original. I suppose originality for me is a combination of, uh, you know, disparate or eclectic styles and uh, the way it's presented and expressed. I guess what I'm saying is that originality can come about by a means of synthesis. The other reason it's difficult to define true originality is because when we listen to music, uh, any style of music, there are always derivatives. I suppose if you really think about it, this is an obvious fact because it's us, right? You know, um, it's the human condition. We see, we copy, interpret and reinterpret. So it stands to reason this would play out in music. Now this relates very closely to the subject of this video, uh, which is the times Frank Zappa's music sounded like someone else's. Now I'm going to make correlations that I hear between Zappa's music and the music of other composers. So I'm going to start off by looking at the time Frank Zappa went Ma Vishnu. I'm then going to make some comparisons with Ligeti's music, in particular the opening chord to Sad Jane and the opening chord to the first piece of Ligeti's Ten Pieces for Wind Quintet. I'm also going to refer to the G-Spot Tornado and Ligeti's Allegro Grazioso from the Six Bagatelles. I'm then going to make a correlation between Roland Kirk's Silverization from the album Please Don't You Cry, Beautiful Edith and King Kong. Finally, I'll be looking at The Baron by Eric Dolphy and Bebop Tango. On and off between April 28th and May 20th, 1973, both the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Frank Zappa shared the bill for several concerts in America. first time he saw them play live it must have been very impressive. In fact, Ruth Underwood refers to this in a discussion she gave in a video made by the Drum Channel a few years back. Okay, but I didn't want to say something incorrect, which was a very vivid memory that I have of uh, scared, going yeah. on a particular <laughs> tour where Mahavishnu, as I just said, opened for Frank opened Zappa. Opened for Frank. And I got to tell you, I, I distinctly remember walking into this gigantic hall and actually physically feeling almost like that television commercial for the speakers being blown back. Yeah. I, I never had experienced a force of volume and just, and Billy Cobham, hello, just brrr, yeah. bam, you know, just all over the place. And I took one look at Frank and I'm telling you, his face changed. Yeah. And I, I actually Whoa. thought to myself, something major is going to be happening. And sure enough. I hope you indulge me for a second while I quote Oscar Wilde. He said that imitation was the most sincerest form of flattery. Well, Zappa's flattery was sometimes skewered when he was referring to John McLaughlin in interviews. There's a lot of musicians coming out these days who make a great thing of their musical virtuosity, especially in guitars, people like John McLaughlin, who I think is most famous for his just ability to move his fingers fast. Mm -hmm. Do you approve of that or do you prefer in guitarists? Uh, just the taste, tasteful playing. Well, I'm impressed by both. You know, anybody who can move his fingers that fast is certainly entitled to some credit. Yeah. You know? But uh, I would rather listen to somebody who surprises me, because the ability to play scales up and down an instrument, whatever that instrument is, as fast as you can go, is something that you can practice forever and ever and just develop manual skill. But in order to play something that just surprises you out of your chair, now that's a little bit harder to do. 
it's skewed because in one sense Zappa is complimenting him for being a very proficient technical guitarist but at the same time mocking it. Somebody else told me too that this was kind of like a clash of the titans and that yeah. both McLaughlin and Zappa would be cranked in their dressing rooms just nat noting yeah. out, yeah. warming up for their respective shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, Jean-Luc was a little bit frightened. Yes. Uh, and, and Jerry as well. I mean, you know. Uh. And also John wow. McLaughlin was extremely charismatic. I yeah. mean, personally. Yeah. And there was a real force to that. Hmm. And so Frank was no longer the only charismatic person in the room, yeah. so to speak. And Ligeti was a Hungarian-born avant-garde composer. <laughs> He composed some very significant pieces that had a profound effect on composers thereafter. Okay, so I'm now going to make a, a correlation between the opening chord from the first piece of 10 pieces for Wind Quintet by Ligeti and the opening chord to Sad Jane. As you can see in the Ligeti score, the uh, instruments are transposed. After the transpositions, the notes I have from the bottom up are E, F, G, A, B. In Sad Jane, you have E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, with the E, A, B notes repeated. So if you take away repetitions, you have E, A, B, C, D. Now the chords are not exactly the same. There's an F and G in Ligeti that's not in Sad Jane. However, the structure is very similar. As a novelty, I took the notes from the opening chord of Sad Jane and applied it to the guitar. So in order of register from the bottom to the top, you have E, A, B, C, D. E, A, B, C, D. It's a beautiful chord. I did the same thing for the opening chord in Ligeti. From the bottom to the top, E, F, uh, G, A, B, E, F, G, A, B. This is one of the reasons why it's really important to experiment with music or to just play with music. Here I'm simply taking the notes from the opening chords of these orchestral pieces of music and playing the, the, the notes on the guitar and they, they sound wonderful on the guitar. It inspires my own musical ideas. I'm not going to copy those chords exactly, but at the very least they're going to be a source of inspiration. So this is why it's really important to just play with music, engage with it, sometimes for the sake of it, because you never know what you might find. Now there's another comparison I wanted to make between Ligeti and Zappa, and uh, that's in the G-Spot Tornado and Allegro Grazioso from the Six Bagatelles. Now, as you can see in the Allegro Grazioso score, there are these uh, quaver note septuplets. These figures are exchanged between the clarinet and the bassoon. Now, if we look at the notes from the G-Spot Tornado, we can see that the sequence is exactly the same apart from one note. Now, there's a little bit of contention when you're making comparisons between two pieces of music that share the pentatonic scale. One of the reasons is because the pentatonic scale consists of only five notes. So if you took a whole list of pieces of music that use the pentatonic scale, well, 
you know, they, there are going to be a lot of similarities there. But bear in mind that this is a novel observation and not an academic one. So the next two pieces I'm going to look at are Roland Kirk's Silverization from the album Please Don't You Cry, uh, Beautiful Edith, and King Kong. Now we know Zappa liked Roland Kirk's music. In fact, the, the two of them played together at a concert in 1969 with the Mothers of Invention. Roland Kirk was a unique jazz musician, but he also had a very idiosyncratic way of playing. Um, in fact, he was renowned for playing two, three saxophones at the same time, sort of harmonizing and uh, doing all these wonderful things. He employed the circular breathing technique. That's where you, you know, you hold a note for a long, long time. And you do this by holding a reserve of air in your mouth. And as you blow that air out through the saxophone, at the same time, you're breathing through your nose and you keep that going. So it sounds like you're never taking a breath. But uh, I just sort of think of the audiences at the time who weren't aware of circular breathing, watching him play and holding notes for like a minute, two minutes and going, my God, this guy's amazing. Uh, but it's simply a technique called circular breathing. So if you listen to the part in Roland Kirk's Silverization, it's referenced at the end of the main melody in King Kong. So when that melody finishes, you have those notes that are sustained, those two notes sustained, they move up a minor third and then back down again. And that's where the similarity is. Zappa once said in reference to Eric Dolphy that he thought he was fantastic. He was specifically referencing him in relation to his performance on Oliver Nelson's Blues and the Abstract Truth and his solo album Iron Man. In one of Brett Clemens' analyses, he points out that among other jazz artists, Dolphy had made a significant contribution to modern jazz by using unpredictable harmonic progressions, vague tonality, and atonal improvisational excursions, supposedly influenced by trends of 20th century European avant-garde composition. This is the same stylistic synthesis Zappa attempts in bebop tango. Eric Dolphy was a real abstract jazz improviser. He was really unique and uh, uh, quite unpredictable. He would play sort of very jagged melodic lines, although he was steeped in the bebop tradition. listen to him solo sometimes he's got a very interest I mean he's got great rhythmic sensibility but every now and then he plays as if he's tripping over himself you know it's as if his his mind is running faster than his fingers so one day I was listening to the Baron from uh, Eric Dolphy's album out there <laughs> very similar to bebop tango. Um, just the collection of notes and certain phrases was like, ah, oh, that's, that's so familiar. So I thought, well, I wonder if I transcribe it. If I transcribe the Baron and write out all the notes and then consult my uh, bebop tango chart, and l let me see if there are actually uh, correlations there. I took phrases that sounded similar to me from bebop tango and I put them on a stave. So you had one phrase from bebop tango, then underneath I would take that exact phrase and reduce it within an octave. 
Uh, so all the notes were confined, mostly confined to an octave. And then underneath that, I would have the barren phrase and I would uh, make correlations between the notes. I would draw lines between the notes to um, illustrate uh, pitch collections, similar pitch collections. Once I had the notes, I tried to reduce some of the phrases to pitch class sets. Now, the way you do this is that you take the notes and then you write them on the stave and try to make the intervallic distances between the notes as compact as possible from the left hand side. And that will give you a pitch class set. So I did that with the specific phrases from Bebop Tango and The Baron. So while I was doing this, I knew it wasn't going to prove much anyway. This sort of uh, pitch class analysis was just for my own reference. But I did notice that the, uh, the pitch class set 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 7 uh, occurred a few times. And then it was a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9 pitch class set. Um, a 0, 1, 3, 4, 7. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes the sets were just almost chromatic, you know, as uh, Clement refers to this uh, technique that Zappa used in his compositions called uh, chromatic saturation, where you could have a, a melodic line that might have 20, 25 notes in there. But if you take all the notes from there, you'd realize that every note it, the full chromatic was covered within that melodic phrase. Thank you.